Okay. Go ahead and dump dump on one of my favorite bands. Go go ahead. <laughs> I'm not going to dump on them. So, um, talking about satellite rides by old ninety sevens. It's a record you recommended. I don't know a month or two ago, and um, so I got it on CD. Um, and it's it's not like it's awful to me. I don't think oh, it's awful good. by any means. <laughs> <laughs> um it's just that uh it does i don't find it too compelling what it reminds me of is some pretty generic sounding power pop slash alt country whatever stupid fucking label you want to put on such things I, it reminds me of things like uh the the plimsolls the shoes even the smithereens, you know, fr from that era. Um, and it even reminds me more of the replacements when they got lame and Soul Asylum when they got lame. And when they basically, their last few records, um, that's what it reminds me of. And again, I don't think it's awful. It just doesn't uh, grab me that much. It's just, um, yeah, I don't know how else to put it other than it's somewhat generic sounding and um, uh, is not too compelling. But I, I know you're more of a power pop guy than I am in general. I could see why you like it. And maybe if I give it a few more spins, it'll grow on me. But um, yeah, that's that's pretty much where I stand on this record. And I have no problem with them being referred to as power pop or alt country. Those are both labels that would fit, particularly alt country. Um, so some of their songs are definitely less, you know, pop than other of their songs. Um, one of the things that I like, it won't surprise you so much about them, is he's Rhett Miller, the lead singer and main writer, is a great lyricist. And once again, that's where our paths diverge. And so, and I was thinking about uh, lyrics and I was thinking about, you know, how important they are again to me. Uh, one of my favorite uh, rock books that I read is called Written in My Soul. And it's interviews with uh, with songwriters like Paul Simon and Neil Young and uh, Lou Reed and Bob Dylan and Springsteen and so forth. And unfortunately, Those my, guys are all right. Yeah, my copy's lost in the ether somewhere, uh, the victim of too many moves. But uh, I will uh, replace it at some point. But like with Springsteen, for example, OK, like the lyrics to uh, Growing Up, OK, a song you know well, um, where the, the lyrics go, uh, the flag of piracy flew from my mast. My sails were set wing to wing. I had a jukebox graduate for a first mate. She couldn't sail, but she sure could sing. And then he goes on to say, I pushed B-52 with the blue and bombed him with the blues with my gear set stubborn on standing. What's so clever about that is B-52 is a bomber. So B B-52 bombed him with the blues, but B-52 is also the number to press on the jukebox. And that is such, and that's why I love lyrics. That It's such a clever turn. And that's what Rhett Miller does with Bill 97s. He hides a lot of Easter, what he refers to as Easter eggs in his songs. And I, I watched a lot of his uh, solo concerts during the pandemic uh, through uh, something called Stage It. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, mm -hmm. but where he would do concerts from his home and you could basically pay whatever you wanted. And people would pay five to 10 bucks per show. And you could also tip them afterwards if you want. And he would not only do the songs, but he would also often... Uh, talk about how he wrote it or what it referred to or that sort of thing and that was just really a wonderful way to to get even more uh familiar and more appreciative of his work mm -hmm. um i also you know the power of words um and again it, this won't surprise you i love writing and i love reading um i know you're a big reader as well do you read fiction as well or really just nonfiction? um yeah i will read i go through phases okay. um and and i'm not that big of a reader uh we're actually, um, I, I seem to be stuck in like reading magazines and, okay. and uh, online uh, newspapers, things like that more than I've, I've always got a book going, but I'm not a voracious reader like I think you are. And, and that's thing. And, and that's where like words have always meant so much to me. Uh, and so another good example of this is <clears throat> um, like if I said to you, what's a very important quality about people? Uh, and you said character. And I said, okay, great. And you said, and you wanted to make it <laughs> emphatic. You said, that guy's got a lot of fucking character. Okay. So, yep, that's clear. But an even better way of putting it is that the late Horace Greeley once said, uh, fame is a vapor, popularity an accident, and riches take wings. The only thing that endures is character. 
And that's just that's good. such a beautiful way to put it. And, and that's, <clears throat> excuse me, something music can't do and only lyrics can do. Um, and now music can get me pumped up. Okay. There's no question that a, a certain guitar solo, drum solo, a band kicking in together or something like that can just get me pumped and going like nothing else. There's no question about that, but it, it that's affecting my mood, my energy, uh, my emotion. It's not affecting my mind in the way so, that lyrics do. Yeah. Lyrics affect <laughs> you in a more cerebral yeah. way, um, which makes sense. And, and I have to, um, reiterate it's not that i don't care about the lyrics right. it's just that um i would still listen to music if it was only instrumental and there was no singing at all or lyrics i would still be heavily into music um and i have to say i never sit around listening to uh poetry you know without uh, music and, and, and i do and i used to read a lot of poetry um uh, and it's not just poets like like e. e cummings or uh william carlos williams but also you know patty smith uh released a book of poetry jim morrison released a book of poetry you know i've read those as well um and, and i think that's also the difference with our with our 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 educational background is that i took classes which you know discussed that and also took classes which uh critiqued uh you know critiqued poetry critiqued books critiqued film um you know and and i remember reading um and i have to just inter interject yeah. and as a rule i i've always been against taking any classes yes <laughs> and that's where our educational paths diverged <laughs> Uh, you know, I loved reading uh, Canterbury Tales in the Old English, like I was able to do in, in my senior in high school. Um, you know, and a lot of the classes I took at Boston University, you know, definitely opened my mind to a lot of other things, which I, I'm very grateful to to this day. Yeah, I was similarly moved by my computer information specialist or computer <laughs> information systems classes that I took. Yeah. yeah just, you know, just just impacted my life in such a um literary way and, and considering that and considering that your brother and sister were not you know big music fans uh and certainly not avant-garde music fans or avant-garde film fans and all not not fans not you wouldn't classify them as music fans yeah, so well, growing yeah. up i didn't have older siblings like you did to yeah. turn me on to stuff it was all through things like cream magazine yeah, so you didn't Circus have that, and, and you didn't have the college experience I had, and even your high school, not to compare, but was probably not the same as Brooklyn High, um, and uh, and so I'm so impressed with with you, you know, because you're what we taught we call a self taught man, a self made man. Yeah, yeah, for better or for worse. Yeah, but but <laughs> but it does, but I think it does end up in differences of how we uh, appreciate things, how we interpret things, how we discover things, how you know we react to things. Um, that's, and I, yeah, I think it makes sense. That's true. Um, when you were asking about nonfiction, like I went through phases and, and it, it seems like it's always uh, specific to like late teens or, or early twenties for all my friends, but like getting really into Kurt Vonnegut. Yeah. Um, I, I probably read 12 of his books in the period of a, maybe a year or a year and a half when I was, you know, my early twenties and um, just ate them up. And uh, since then, you know, I'll, I'll read the occasional nonfiction book, uh, but probably not as much as you do. Like, I mean, I mean, fiction book, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, fiction is what I was talking about. Um, so, like, for example, now, do you have uh, a fiction book going? Uh, so right now, not at the moment, um, but I, I usually do. I, I'm always balancing. I, I probably do one in one. I'm probably doing a fiction book and a nonfiction book at, at the same time because because I'm certainly interested in a lot of nonfiction as well. Um, I certainly have a lot of writers I really like: uh, Richard Russo, Don DeLillo, uh, Thomas Pynchon, um, Ann Beatty, um, uh, Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, my sister turned me on to Kurt Vonnegut, um, and, and that was another thing. My, my my parents and my siblings were all big readers and so yeah. if if someone was reading a book we all ended up reading that book and so oh. and, you know. and your your dad was a professor for yeah. crying out loud yeah. Was, yeah. was he an english professor i forget he was not um he taught uh uh um sociology and anthropology okay so still like yeah. just you know compared to um the environment i grew up uh you know books art books music movies 
none of it was presented to me. It just wasn't really around for the most part. And for some reason, uh, I had to, you know, so, some reason music in particular and, and movies really um, struck me as like, you know, the most fascinating thing. And uh, I, I don't really know why growing up in a tiny little town. So it is interesting that you and I um, have all these things that we bond over. Usually it's music or movies or yeah. and some, some sports, but Bubble uh, hockey. with, uh, yeah, um, with such, um, such varying backgrounds of uh, the way we grew up and in the environment we grew up, it's, it's and, kind of interesting to look at that. Yeah. And, and I think there, there is something that stops someone because my, my dad's father, my grandfather is you know, long gone. Um, he was a bricklayer. Uh, never had a college education, never, I don't think he ever, he completed high school. Uh, he was not a reader. He was not, you know, he didn't listen to music um, or, you know, except for maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, some like uh, klezmer music or something. And, and and my dad was a voracious reader and, and music. Uh, and, you know, my dad loved music more than anything. Um, and so it's interesting uh, that, uh, like, you know, if you had kids, uh, they would probably be interested in music. They'd probably be interested in, in film because you feel so strongly. And so sure. once it starts, then it can really, you know, trickle down. Yeah. And um, I was a stepdad for a while. And to your point, I was um, constantly um, exposing um, my stepkid at the time to music and um movies in fact i was teaching him how to play drums um and was you know constantly showing him movies that uh, meant a lot to me and you know it, it, i none of it really s stuck yeah which was you know that's that's the way it goes but yeah. you you can um try and influence people by uh presenting music let's just use music as an example as something that's important to you and perhaps you know perhaps you will get into it in much the same way so here you go and i think it's the nature of any kid i know i was like this and my sister's uh kid uh daughter is definitely like this in terms of if your parents or step parents are presenting it to you you have to initially resist it with all your might um and uh and i was certainly like that when my dad would say you have to see this movie or that movie him saying that that was the kiss of death then i would actually finally get around and see it and go Hey, you know what? You're right. Like, yeah, you know, but it's just nature of a teenager in particular to, you know, to throw up that wall of resistance, which is too bad. But that's teenagers, I think, everywhere of all time, you know, so there's there's that quote. And it, I don't know if it came from Springsteen talking about how when he was, I think, 16, uh, his dad was the most idiotic moron. Uh, in the world and then by the time he became i don't know 21 or something he suddenly realized his dad was the smartest person in the world so the actual quote is mark twain is and, it mark twain okay. and mark twain well, said springsteen mark twain <laughs> yeah the know, same thing whatever uh, when uh when mark mark twain said when he was 14 he thought his his father was the dumbest man alive and he said by the time i turned 21 i couldn't believe what my father had learned in the last seven years <laughs> that's, that's it that's it so parts of it stuck with me i just yeah. forgot where it came from yeah um uh i have to mention um a really good documentary series that i recently finished watching it's on max formerly known the artist formerly known as hbo yes uh it's uh i think three or four i think four parts um and it's all about stacks records yeah i saw that i saw that right when my max subscription ran out because I always will do uh, this. I'll do like this pay platform for like a month or two, sure. see everything I need to see, then cancel it and go to the next one. And I'm always bouncing around because uh, yeah. I'm not going to pay for 10 platforms at the same time. And unfortunately, on the last day, I, I wasted my I wasted the last day watching Dune 2 oh. and, and and then saw the stacks one just yeah just as it expired. And so that is totally on my list. I'm I absolutely I almost signed up right away, re-signed up. But I was like, oh, OK, it'll be there and I'll get back to it but yeah. i absolutely want to see that it's not going anywhere um yeah. it is really good and you know some of those uh music documentaries whether it's just a single single film or a series so they can be hit or, hit or miss Definitely. and a lot of times uh they're somewhat redundant and they just continue to recap the same shit over and over again and yep. um this one is 
one of the better ones that I've seen for sure. And uh, I'm a huge fan of of all the Stax music, you know, Same. from Booker T and the MGs, Otis Redding, yep. Carla Thomas, Carla Rufus Thomas, Thomas yep. um, uh, oh, the Bar Kays, uh, oh, and of course, Isaac Hayes. Yep. And uh, it brought uh, it brought all of that stuff back to the forefront for me. So I've been digging through my soul collection and revisiting a lot of that stuff. And um, man, it really is just some of the best music ever made. And put no to, question. Put to vinyl. Yeah, I love that stuff. And I'm glad to hear it is a good documentary because you're right. A lot of them are very hit and miss. The two-part Paul Simon documentary, pretty good. Not outstanding, but pretty good. The Beach Boys one that was just came out on Disney, again, pretty good. Not great by any means, but pretty good. And so both worth seeing, but not anything to knock yourself out for. Mm -hmm. um, whereas... I've probably seen the kids are all right. I don't know, a hundred times. Um, <laughs> and so, and, and that's a little different than an, a documentary, obviously, but still along the similar lines. Still um, a music movie. Yeah. And as I've mentioned band. before about the Ken Burns uh, jazz uh, series, a t 10 part series on the history of jazz. This is wonderful. I've seen that multiple times as well. Um, so. Um, and another one that I watched the first part of, it's on PBS and it just came out. It's um, all about disco, going back to one of our earlier conversations oh, yeah. about how when we were of, of the age, back when disco was all the rage, so mid to late 70s, we wouldn't have been caught dead, A, listening to disco, let alone admitting we liked it. Um, and uh, this one... Uh, I've only watched the first episode so far and it's, it's, it's okay. Uh, much like the, the other ones you mentioned, it didn't, didn't blow me away. Like the stacks one did the stacks one is just so compelling. It's just such a incredible story. This tiny little label in Memphis, Tennessee started by a brother and a sister yeah. um, with basically no money Two white folks in the middle of an all black neighborhood uh, converted an old, I guess it was an old movie theater into the studio and there's a record store right next to it that the sister ran. It's just, just uh, uh, like classic American success story uh, put to film and all, you know, around our favorite topic, music. Uh, just really just so compelling. It's amazing stuff like that. Look at, you know, Sun Records that Sam Phillips started you know, uh, and and all the artists like you know Elvis Presley and Jerry Lee Lewis and Johnny Cash and all that that ended up recording this tiny, you know, place in the middle of nowhere. You know, um, uh, yeah, and Chess Records, another one. You know, coincidentally, I watched uh, Jerry Lee Lewis Trouble in Mind mm -hmm. just last night, which is the documentary that one of the Cohen brothers did. I think it was Ethan Cohen oh, came okay. out a year or two ago, yeah. and it's on right now. It's on uh, Canopy. And uh, that was really good. It, you know, a, a lot of the old old rock and rollers are the original ones from Chuck Berry to um, uh, Little Richard to Jerry Lee Lewis. I appreciate all that stuff, but I it's not like I am ever sitting around listening to them as much as I uh, respect the fact that they're the like the the fourth forefathers of, of rock music. Yep. Um, but man, Jerry Lee Lewis, he, he, uh, this documentary is really good, by the way. It's another one that I would put, uh, up there as like a must see. Um, and I, he was just a, an incredible, incredible musician and performer. And, you know, this, I don't know, the, the songs themselves, I, I don't, they don't, they don't hold up in the same way that say, some of those early Chuck Berry songs do, in my opinion. Uh, but what a performer. And um, to go as long as he did to have that kind of longevity. He only died, like, I think two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And he started in the very early 50s. Yeah. Um, but check that one out if, if you haven't seen it. And you haven't yeah, I've not seen it. I, and I definitely will check that out. Um, and, and I like his music. Uh, the person, not as much, but I definitely like his music. Uh, to, to that point and yeah anyone who marries their 13 year old cousin that's yeah I mean, that's got to throw up some red flags no doubt and i'm assuming that's what you're talking about yeah you say and, that, 
the person. And also he was not known as the most wonderful bandmate or, you know, or band leader by any means. Um, definitely prone to explosive temper, that sort of thing. Um, and so. in this movie, um, one, one of the things that I found unique in this movie, a lot of rock docs, um, it's, you know, uh, a little bit of footage of a song and then a talking head who um, either, you know, played with the person, was in the band or whatever. There's, there's a real uh, distinct format for most of them. This one, um, to Ethan Cohen's credit, it's basically just all Jerry, all Jer meaning uh, there's not, not a lot of talking heads. If there is a talking head, it's from the past. It's footage from, say, the 70s or 60s or 80s or whatever. Um, and it's not contemporary talking head footage. Um, and almost all of it is made up of Jerry talking himself or playing music. And it'll show like a whole song, a whole performance of something that is just incredible, an incredible performance. Um, I was kind of blown away by how how compelling I found him to be where I was always aware of him, of course, but never really dug in deep. So that's a, that's a good way to, to learn more about him. That's definitely a good description of the, of what makes a good documentary because the, the, the real, the, the, you know, the knockoff ones are always filled with talking heads, more talking heads than, you know, actual music or actual interviews. Mm -hmm. And, and, and especially when it's like someone like, you're like, who the fuck is that? Or, you know, why are they even in this thing? You know, who's, who cares about their opinion? That's when, you know, you're watching trash, you know? And usually a, a little snippet of a song, yeah, you know, a live performance or something, just a little snippet and then back to the talking head. And, um, and, and the reason I didn't see the one on the replacements is, is from what I read, they couldn't, they don't, there's no, they don't play any replacements music during it. So, um, <sighs> Yeah, that's that's absolutely correct. And I will have to say uh, it's for what it is. It's yeah. it's really good. It's okay. basically just people talking about their love of the replacements and, and why they were so good. And um, I'm only I, I can only assume that the uh, replacements themselves didn't buy off on letting any of their music be used or any footage of them playing. Um, but that aside it's it's actually worth checking out i've i found it to be pretty compelling all right not nonetheless okay. and, it, and it seems like there's no way i could i could like this but yeah. it's it's pretty pretty damn well done interesting all right so maybe we'll check it out um going back to jerry lee lewis um and uh chuck berry um uh, for a moment um the ones the who blow me away i mean like obviously what what chuck berry did was just really ridiculous like in terms of you know the songs he wrote he's sort of like shakespeare in terms of how could this one guy have written all these songs and where did he come from and all and it's just amazing also another guy not that popular with his band but um uh but uh buddy holly buddy holly blows me away in terms of of how advanced he was with the different like recording techniques he did and the and the and his different songs and all just amazing uh also big big fan of the everly brothers um but 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 buddy holly like they were great everly brothers great great songwriting great singing i really love them still a big fan um but buddy holly just again his influence you know there is like if it wasn't you know that's one of those if it wasn't for buddy holly would there have been the beatles because you know he was such an influence on them um, and, and it's amazing. He was in Lubbock, Texas. And let me tell you, I live a few hours away from Lubbock, Texas. Lubbock, Texas is the ass end of nowhere. Okay. And here is this geeky white guy with big horn room glasses and all like, you know, creating this incredible music. It's, it's just hard to fathom. Lubbock isn't known for, for, um, churning out like visionary rock and roll artists. Uh, far from and, and, and you know as opposed to like you know stacks okay it may have been you know in the unique circumstances but still memphis was memphis you know um in terms of you know uh, or if you're in new orleans or if you're in chicago or if you were in new york you know it, yeah they're not it, lubbock I, yeah I, I i definitely see what you're saying um but i will also say that um you know, back then, Memphis, uh, Stax is one of the reasons Memphis ended True. up being on the map, yeah. you know, and a couple others, you know, like that uh, Presley guy. Um, yeah. yeah. But, and so it's a chicken and egg thing. But but Memphis was also a big uh, jazz destination as well already. Again, Lubbock, like you're there because you're stationed there. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's uh, 
you know, bringing up Buddy Holly in much the same way as some of the other uh, forefathers. I, I've never really, I have like a couple compilation records of my Buddy Holly and they're fine, but uh, I've never really done a deep dive into, and really into that whole era of the beginnings of, of rock music. Um, it's never, there's, there's not quite the draw with that stuff for me anyway, as like, say, what happened in the 60s, starting with the Beatles and the Stones and the Who, and then everything from then on to through, I don't know, their mid 80s. Um, but maybe, maybe, it, you know, it's worth uh, doing the deep dive into that stuff. And maybe I'm going to find out that uh, actually, you know, this is where it's at for me right now. I also think, like, just for me personally, because I was a history major, and so I'm always fascinated by the past. If I was given the choice to be able to teleport to the future or to the past, I would choose the past 10 times out of 10. Um, and it, and I think it's one of the reasons I love those documentaries. The other Ken Burns documentary is the one on country music, which mm -hmm. is also just wonderful. And I'm just fascinated by by music being made in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s. It's just amazing that what people went through, you know, to, you know, bands think, oh, we've got it tough now. Like, if you wanted to make it as an artist in the 1920s, it was a little harder, you know, and uh, yeah, try, try being a mixed race band, like yeah, the T and the MGs in a very, very segregated, segregated Memphis, Tennessee of the early 60s. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and that that uh, series goes into some of the racial issues that that uh, they ran into uh, Booker T and the MGs specifically uh, because they were. You know, there's two white guys and two black guys in the yeah. band. And, and so they can't stay at the same hotel, you know, those stuff, are, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um uh I think it was Steve Cropper who was the guitarist of Booker T and the MGs. Um, to his credit, like um uh, I think there was times where they would basically make a, a stand for their bandmates, the um Booker T and Al Jackson, the drummer, um, when they would run into that kind of bullshit. Um, but it's it's one of the reasons why that whole series is so compelling. Just the whole stacks story is is so compelling. And it's amazing that that they 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 you know uh, persevered and and prospered. Um, it'd be so easy to say, you know what? What are we doing? Screw this. Let me only play with black guys. Let me only play with white guys. Then we can we can pl play the same clubs and the same restaurants, eat at the same restaurants and all. And life is so much easier. Mm -hmm. As opposed to no, I've got a vision for my music, and this is what it is, and this is what we're going to do. Um, and and even even bands now, or certainly bands, you know, when I was listening to, you know, in the seventies and eighties and nineties and all, like you know, piling six guys into like a a small cramped, you know, Chevy Equine van, and like I can't, I can't imagine <laughs> driving from city to city, uh, eating wherever you can eat that's open, you know, uh, getting oh, out of no sleep, fuck, <laughs> another fucking waffle house, <laughs> yeah, you know, a, a, you have to be dedicated. Um, and it's amazing. There's a guy who just uh, uh, suited up for the Red Sox uh, a couple weeks ago. He played 11 years in the minors, and he's now getting his first chance. You play 11 years in the minors, you are dedicated. This is all you care about. You you travel around with those vans for you know 20 years. Like you're saying, this is what I want to do with my life. I mean, I, I think a lot of people, and I I tip my hat. I think a lot of people would say, what am I doing? You know, um, and certainly if you're married or, you know, or in a relationship or have other options or, you know, whatever, um, you know, you must occasionally look in the mirror and go, really, am I, am I, am I still doing this? Am I really doing this? You know, so no, no comment. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, and also in particular, if, if you don't love the music you're playing or don't think there is a future in it or, or aren't like, you know, wild about your bandmates. I mean, there's so many reasons. You know, or in my case, I'm just claustrophobic. <laughs> just being in the in the van itself would be, you know, uh, enough. So, yeah, be, being in a in a relative well, a regular sized van with, you know, uh, two three guitar amps, a big bass cabinet, a full drum kit, and then four or five guys or gals and driving hundreds of miles to play, you know, in Johnson City. Tennessee on a Sunday um yeah it to your point you gotta love it and you gotta be really you, you have to persevere and it'll, like that guy in the majors or in, who was in the minors for 11 years that's that's you know textbook perseverance yeah 
uh, and he's married with a kid. And so your wife's got to say, okay, it's your dream and I understand and I'll support you. Um, you know, when uh, you do not make much money in the minor leagues, uh, ba- you know, professional sports may be glamorous, not in minor league baseball. <laughs> no, and, only at the upper echelons. It's yeah. just like music. Hey, and when you're same, in the minor thing. leagues yeah. of music, yeah. you, you don't make shit. Um, and the ones who finally do break through, you know, they obviously can make uh, lots of money. But that's like, you know, it, it literally is like one in a million. Yeah. I mean, you look at the Stones, they went around that same sort of van, you know, in England, and then within five years, six years, they had their own plane, you know, um, and, you know, touring all over the world. But yeah, for every Rolling Stones, okay, that made it, what, two million, (laughs) two million bands just like them who didn't? Mm -hmm. And how much of that is luck as opposed to talent? You know, I think luck plays a huge factor. You would know more it than does. I would, but you know, if you don't meet the right person at the right time or play in the right club, or you know, there can be this sort of just like we were just lucky right at the moment, you know. Sure. Or, even, or in my case, even like I'm a dog trainer, that's my profession. And when uh, the pandemic hit, everyone on the planet got a pandemic puppy, and, and dog ownership in this country went up 350 percent. No kidding. And my business exploded. And that's yet, great. if the, if COVID had happened to dogs and not people, I would not be in this business. I would be, you know, working at Mickey D's, you know? And so it's just, it's, it's just fate and nature and luck and all. And again, especially I think if you're a musician, I, like if, you know, if Bruce didn't meet John Hammond at that right time, who knows if we'd even know that the future of rock and roll was named Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. Yeah. You know? You're right. Uh, well, and I think it applies to everything in life, you know, it's luck and chance. And what is, what is the equation? It's like, um, oh, uh, like two, like 20% hard work, 20% talent, and then like 60% luck or something like that. I forget. I didn't Mark Twain say something about that. Well, I, I actually always quote Ecclesiastes of all people when it comes to this, who said, I have gone and seen everything under the sun. And the race does not always go to the swiftest, nor the battle to the strongest. Nay, time and chance happeneth to them all. Damn it, I was going to pull that out for you, <laughs> and, that, and, and that is that is true. Because um, again, I think I, I think if you interview, it would be interesting to interview like 100 bands or 50 or whatever successful bands and say, what was, what happened? Because so many bands, like we've talked about before, Yes is a band where their label almost dropped them after the first two albums. Uh, Lou Reed, the, al- the label definitely wanted to drop them after the first album. And if it wasn't for David Bowie, Lou Reed would never re- record another album. Uh, Hall & Oates, I think they had five unsuccessful albums and they went on to become the best-selling duo of all time. Uh, you know, and, and again, it's just like you're at the, the whim of that record company. They, yeah, they drop but, you. At least back then, though, um, and this is where the game has changed so much today. Uh, back then, uh, labels would allow time for artists to develop. So, whether some. it was, you yeah. know, most of them, yeah. most of them. When you think of like your Elton Johns, you know these these really huge artists. Even some of the ones you just mentioned, um, uh, Lou Reed, um, uh, oh. he, like Elton John, for example, had. Um, a couple records uh, released on a, a little label called Uni, of all things, uh, before he hit it really big. And um, other, uh, uh, even going up into the 80s, a band like REM, you know, th- their label allowed them to develop and grow into, you know, the commercial monster that they became. And today, uh, artists just don't get that chance. No. The, the whole the whole model has changed, of it, course. Unbelievably changed. But also, I think it, it, what you needed also, even back in those days, was you needed a champion at the label. You needed at least one person who really believed in you. Yeah, and even if you didn't sell, like, you know, yeah. two million records your first yeah. time out. It's like, but uh, this person believes in them enough and is telling the CEO of the company that yeah. just stick with them. I know they're going to, they're going to hit and they're going to pay off for us. Yeah. And, and you need, you need that person. Oftentimes it happened. Yeah. You know? uh, and, and it's interesting with Elton John, if he had never met Bernie Toppin, would Elton John have become what Elton John became? Um, Once again, I, going back to lyrics. Yeah. He couldn't I, write I, shit. Well, I've, I've <laughs> heard, uh, I, I recently picked up this, um, this box set of Elton John early stuff and some of the some of the really early stuff 
with lyrics that he wrote. And to your point, yeah, it's let's just say it's no, uh, <laughs> you know, someone saved my life tonight or, or whatever. Leave on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any, you know, just name any great Elton song from that era. Um, yeah, it was pretty, pretty pedestrian lyrics, like you know, uh, you know, baby, baby type lyrics. And, and it was like a note, uh, uh, like you know, he put up a flyer in the wall, or, you know, top and 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 uh, and Elton John having to see it. I mean, again. Would, would Elton John have still had a successful career? Yeah, probably. Would it have been a mega star career? Probably not. Who, who knows? Uh, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Um, I had to mention uh, I I needed to go back to something we talked about a while ago because it, an example of it popped in my brain. We were talking about is there any band or artist that we like a lot, even though we don't like the singer or the singer's voice. Yeah, yeah. Um, and one that ca came to mind for me um, was Jane's Addiction um, because I, I their first three records are some of my favorite hard rock records, hands down. And when I think about it, that fucking croaking, screeching Perry Farrell, I don't really like his voice, but it works well. I, I, when I think of good Jane's Addiction records, the voice is just like it's almost like okay well it is what it is it works it makes them sound somewhat unique even though i don't particularly like the voice you know in a traditional sense um so that was the the one example i could come up with and, and that's that. and that's interesting that there is one I, but yeah i think you'd be hard pressed to find 10 20 you know i i you know it, it's sort of like like an actor or an audiobook I, I really like audiobooks, and it could be a book I really want to listen to. But if I don't like the person whose voice is reading it, forget it. There's no way I can listen to it. Um, and there are some actors where I just I, I don't like their voice. It happens less in acting because you're watching other things and all. But certainly music, where you're just putting a, a record on, you know, and 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 if the voice annoys you, then I, you're you're dead in the water most of the time. So. When you're listening to to music, rock music in particular, yeah, you're the focus is on the vocals more than anything and yeah if it, that's not working for you it is tough th now th there is an example of, of an album i like where i don't particularly like the singer but i don't dislike him uh, but brian johnson on acdc's back in black mm -hmm. uh, i really do like back in black quite a bit and it's not because of his his voice um it, but but i don't hate it Okay, as opposed to, as I've said, Eddie Vedder's voice or or Getty Lee's voice, where I really dislike their singing. Um, so, um, um, and uh, the reason that Jane's Addiction um, uh, comment even came into my mind is because they recently got back together with all the original members. Yeah. I know they're the, they're you know what they're the first rock band who ever got back <laughs> together <laughs> 30 years later with all the original members and are touring. <laughs> and um so of course I have to go on to YouTube okay. and um check out what they sound like now. Yeah. And man, if I wasn't a fan of Perry Farrell's voice then <laughs> oh my God. He he's it's it's unbelievable how bad he sounds. The rest of the band band sounds great. I mean, they're they're playing their classic tracks and they're playing them very well and uh, very well. Um, you would never know it was thirty five years later. But Perry Farrell, it's it's like he's not even trying to sing. He just he'll just kind of croak something out at the right time instead of, he's not even singing. It's it's unreal. You should check it out. I I don't think it's just me. It's, okay. I, I, I will bad. I, I think, you know, in terms of the other, the rest of the band being good, I think it's much easier, not easy, but easier to keep your musical chops than your voice, mm. you know, 20, 30 years later. Mm, it depends. Depends on uh, what kind of physical condition you're in. If for, for guitars, bass player, or drummer, or, you know, you, you still have to be in pretty deep. You have to have continued to work at it. Or it is very much use it or lose it in a lot of ways. Which you might sense. still be able to play, but certainly not at the same level level of um, 
you know, 35 years earlier when you were living and breathing it. But I, I, check, check out, do you even like Jane's Addiction? Yeah, actually? I can take him or leave him. Uh, yeah, uh, you're uh, never a big fan. Yeah, uh, I was never a fan of grunge, and I know you hate labels. I was never a fan of grunge. Uh, but of all the bands, they were one of the ones I preferred to the rest. So, so I'd... I I have to I have to say you can, it's you can't really lump them into 